So now we're going to talk about how we breathe. There are four major processes of respiration. Pulmonary ventilation is physically bringing air into and out of the lungs. A patient can be ventilated, but if their alveolar and respiratory membranes are damaged, you won't have adequate gas exchange. So you can ventilate them all day long, but it won't really be doing anything because the oxygen can't get into the blood and the carbon dioxide can't leave the blood. So ventilation is important, but really meaningless, without respiration. Respiration is an exchange of gases. External respiration is talking about an exchange of gases between the alveoli and the blood. We consider that external because if you think about it, the inside of our respiratory tract is really considered the outer surface of our body. It's only when the substances get into our bloodstream that substances are internalized into our body. So external respiration is the exchange of gases between the alveoli and the blood. Transport is talking about the transportation of those gases through the bloodstream. And internal respiration is talking about an exchange of gases between the blood and the tissues. Internal respiration is that process of cellular respiration that we just went through. So that happens at the tissue level. To understand respiration, you need to understand a little bit about chemistry. And one of the major gas laws in chemistry is Boyle's Law. What Boyle's Law states is that pressure and volume are inversely related. That means that if pressure goes up, volume goes down. If volume goes up, pressure goes down. So one goes up, the other one goes down. Think about having a balloon in front of you. When you have a balloon and you start to compress it, you start to decrease the volume of the balloon. So you're squeezing this balloon inside of your hands. You're decreasing the volume and you're increasing the pressure inside of there. Eventually that balloon's going to pop. So the pressure inside of there is going to become too much. It's going to overcome the elastic or the rubber of the balloon and it's going to cause that balloon to rupture. Think about another example. You have a garden hose outside and that hose is trickling out water. When you put your thumb over the end of the hose, you're decreasing the volume that that water has to go through. That's going to increase the pressure of the water, and that's going to cause the water to squirt out pretty far. That'll come in handy when you start talking about regulating blood pressure once you get up to advanced AMP. And I already talked a little bit about that in this class, but advanced you kind of go into a little bit more detail about how we regulate pressure by changing the diameter of our arteries. So, back to respiration. It's all dependent on pressures and volumes. So what pressures are we talking about? Atmospheric pressure is the pressure of the atmosphere around us. Our bodies always want to be in equilibrium with atmospheric pressure. So no matter what, the inside of our body wants to be the same pressure as the outside of the body. Intrapulmonary pressure is the pressure inside of the lung. Intrapleural pressure is the pressure between the lung and the cavity wall. Intrapleural pressure is always negative. That means that it's always less than atmospheric pressure. This allows for the lung to stay slightly open at all times. If intrapleural pressure ever equalizes with the atmosphere, we will collapse that lung. And because each lung is in separate pleural cavities, we can collapse one lung while the other lung is perfectly fine. But that intrapleural pressure has to always remain less than atmospheric. If it ever equalizes with the atmosphere, we will collapse the lung. So inspiration bringing air in, expiration bringing air out. The principle of how this works is if we increase our thoracic cavity volume, so we make our chest really big, increased volume decreases the pressure. So inside of our chest, the pressure is going to be less. 
So air from the atmosphere naturally just wants to pass into our lungs to equalize with atmospheric pressure. If we relax our thoracic cavity and we decrease the volume, this is going to become pressurized, kind of like squeezing on that balloon. Air is naturally going to want to flow out of the lungs down its pressure gradient. So here are the processes listed out for you and you should take some time to kind of pause the video and think about these and write down the steps and everything. So the diaphragm descends and the rib cage rises. Your diaphragm, so under normal circumstances your rib cage is kind of like that and like that and your diaphragm is here. The diaphragm descends and the rib cage rises. So your thoracic cavity volume has increased. The lungs are stretched open and intrapulmonary volume increases. Intrapulmonary pressure drops, so now the pressure inside of here goes way down. So air is going to want to flow into the lungs down its, its pressure gradient until the pressure on the inside of the lung is equal to the pressure in the outside environment. During expiration, expiration is a passive process. When we say the rib cage rises, the muscles that have to contract in order for that to happen are called the external intercostals. And the diaphragm is actively contracting at that time. But when we go through expiration, those muscles are just relaxing. The diaphragm rises because it's relaxing again. And the rib cage descends because those muscles relax. Thoracic cavity volume in, um, sorry, thoracic cavity volume decreases, so the lungs passively recoil and intrapulmonary volume decreases. With decreased volume, you have increased pressure, and this pressure is going to want to come out. So the intrapulmonary pressure rises, air flows out of the lungs down its pressure gradient until the pressure is equal to zero. Usually when people have issues with their respiratory system, you hear wheezing upon exhale because what normally should be a passive process is now requiring them energy. So their inspiration is normal, but their expiration is where you're going to hear the wheezing sound. What happens when people go into higher altitudes? At higher altitudes, it's not that there's less oxygen, it's just that there's less pressure up there. If you have less pressure, you're going to have less pressure coming into the lungs. So less oxygen is ultimately going to get into the lungs and you can suffer from things like altitude sickness. Conditioning yourself for ascending into higher altitudes is extremely important. So some of the pulmonary volumes and capacities. So the tidal volume is the amount of air that's exhaled after a normal inspiration. So you breathe in normal and you breathe out normal. Whatever's breathed out normally is your tidal volume. The expiratory reserve volume is the largest volume of additional air that can be forcibly exhaled. If you are going to measure someone's expiratory reserve volume, you're going to have to contract those internal intercostals. Remember, expiration should naturally be a passive process, but if you want to force extra air out of the lungs, you're going to have to contract these muscles to do so. The inspiratory reserve volume is the amount of air that can be forcibly inhaled after a normal inspiration. And the residual volume is the amount of air that cannot be forcibly exhaled. This is the minimum amount of air required to stay in the lungs so that the lung does not collapse. A person can't breathe out extra hard and make their own lungs collapse. That would be crazy. So that residual volume stays in the lungs to make sure that those lungs are not collapsing. And this kind of shows those um, lung capacities and the expiratory reserve volume, the tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, anatomical dead space, residual volume, and so forth. The vital capacity is the sum of the inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and expiratory reserve volume.
The minimal volume is the amount of air remaining after the residual volume. The inspiratory capacity is the maximum number of air that can be inspired after a normal expiration. The functional residual capacity is the amount of air at the end of a normal respiration. And your total lung capacity is the sum of all four lung volumes, the total amount of air that a lung can hold. This diagram kind of shows that pretty well. With all of these volumes, they're just terms that you have to kind of wrap your mind around. I'm not going to be too picky of making you memorize every single one of these capacities and volumes, but it is relevant to health, especially if you're going to be a respiratory therapist. All of these volumes are important and they're measured in different ways, and they tell you a little bit dif something different about the status of the patient's respiratory system. Alveolar ventilation is the volume of inspired air that reaches the alveoli. In some cases, this is the key. If a patient has pneumonia, they have fluid accumulating inside of their alveoli or inside of their lungs, deep inside their lung tissue in the lower respiratory tract. Air is not going to be able to reach the alveoli if they have pneumonia. The anatomical dead space, passageways occupied by air that do not participate in gas exchange. And then physiological dead space, anatomical dead space, plus any alveoli that are not able to perform gas exchange. If you have pulmonary disease in a patient, if their alveoli has collapsed, if they have emphysema and the alveoli have enlarged and decreased the surface area for that exchange of gases, that's all part of physiological dead space.